there's a growing problem in the uranium sector, and it's bad enough that even the majors are starting to talk about it more openly. We're headed for a cliff, but not a demand cliff, a supply cliff, with some of the largest producers globally now starting to signal the looming crisis that we're faced with. Just as sentiment has finally turned positive for nuclear power globally, global production is set to face a full-grown problem within the next decade. How bad is it? Let's dive in. By the mid-2030s, around 2035, we will face a structural uranium deficit. To meet this unmet demand, we would need at least another Kazatomprom, which is impossible. Those are the words of Merit Tulibayev, first deputy CEO and chief financial officer of the world's largest uranium producer, Kazatomprom. The commentary comes from this year's World Atomic Week Forum held in Moscow. Given the location, we don't exactly have a clip of the commentary, but it was covered in regional media. While the words may seem promotional in nature, the stark reality here is that they aren't wrong. There's a looming supply crisis, and Kaz Prom is at the center of it. Excluding geopolitics for a moment, which can be tough when it comes to uranium in particular, this coming supply deficit is largely the fault of those who are talking about it most. Kaz Prom, as it currently stands, is the largest producer globally of uranium. On a nominal 100% basis, 2025 production from their assets was initially guided to come in at around 85 million pounds, before being cut back to about 77 million pounds in late August due to some production issues. The second largest producer, Cameco, produces roughly half that on a 100% basis, with 2025 guidance originally calling for 36 million pounds of production before their own production issues resulted in guidance being cut by 2 to 4 million pounds. Collectively, the two names are estimated to represent about 38% of the world's total uranium production on an annual basis. And both, as of late, have been preaching about the supply deficit coming, with both names including a similar chart on their most recent investor decks. Yet, at the same time, they whine that current market conditions don't support producing at full tilt. The irony here, of course, is that the world's two largest uranium producers are also the ones complaining about the oncoming supply issues. I wonder what management teams we can point to for the near-term thinking that got us into this situation. Maybe they should have spent a bit more money on exploration or done a bit of M&A. In the case of Kaz Prom, as per market commenter Piotr Turek over on Twitter, Kaz Prom is basically facing a supply cliff that is expected to hit around 2031. And they need massive exploration and development spending between then and now to avoid that cliff being realized. And Turek isn't wrong, not even in the slightest. Current production forecasts suggest that the Kazakh miner will see peak production in 2027 based on current estimates before slow decline accelerates in 2031 with the advent of like eight different mines either hitting end of life or the end stages of operations where production declines materially. Production is expected to fall from roughly 32,000 tons of uranium in 2027 to 28,000 tons by 2031. But by 2033, production is expected to fall to 20,000 tons. Which is not good, considering the current trajectory of uranium demand with all the recent announcements for new power plants. But these projections are just that, projections. Kaz Prom has already cut back on 2026's estimated production, with Kaz Prom in August cutting 2026 guidance from 33,000 tons to 30,000 tons, which is a reduction of about 10% or 3,000 tons. The company blames a supply-demand balance in the market for this reduction. But we're not so sure that's an accurate excuse. The cuts, assuming that they are indeed a market-based response rather than something like bad geology or weak supply of sulfuric acid, at the very least might push out that supply cliff by a year or two. But it's not a long-term solution. Kaz Prom obviously recognizes the problem at hand. If it's obvious to market commentators like us, then it means it's probably been obvious to execs for a while now. And those near-term cuts are just a sign of it. On top of the near-term reductions, the company in September stated that they intend to triple exploration activities in-country moving forward while at the same time entering an arrangement for uranium exploration in Jordan and Mongolia. Meaning the situation is dire enough that they're stepping out of their comfort zone. This seems like the appropriate time now to also highlight that the issues that plague Kaz Prom also plague the world's number two uranium producer, Cameco. 
except the problem is more acute for Cameco, who on a technical level only operates two producing mines, while having a role in a third operation, Inkai, which is a joint venture with Kaz Adamprom. But in fairness to Cameco, they have a number of past producing or development stage assets that in theory they could bring into production for the right amount of money. But this is where Cameco gets obscure. If you ask them, what matters is committed sales, rather than production outlooks, because they do disciplined production aligned with market opportunities. In terms of reserves, they've got 457 million pounds of uranium on the books, three quarters of which is based in Canada. And as for resources, there's 408 million pounds of measured and indicated material and an additional 153 million pounds of inferred resources. But those reserves and resources are highly, highly concentrated. As in 251 million pounds of reserves or 55% of all reserves are held at MacArthur River. And 23% are at Cigar Lake, with the remainder at Inkai. As for resources, things are a bit more diversified here. 31% of measured and indicated resources are held at Yiliri, which is an early stage development asset in Australia with low grade ore that seemingly hasn't been touched for nearly a decade. While well, 13% is held at each of Millennium and Kintyre, both of which are again undeveloped projects. 9% of resources are also held at Inkai, while well, the remainder is scattered across a plethora of projects, i.e. not all that easy to access without substantial further investment. But on that front, even the operating assets are not immune to requiring significant capital expenditures. While MacArthur River is expected to operate until 2044, ground freezing has not been going to plan with Cameco recently cutting 2025 guidance back from 18 million pounds on a 100% basis, all the way to 14 to 15 million pounds. And at Cigar Lake, the mine permits currently expire in 2031, and a significant expansion is required for the mine to continue to operate beyond the current plan. This is something that Cameco has been tiptoeing around publicly for a while now, and they'll need to make a hard decision on it rather imminently, due to the time required for sufficient ground freezing within the Athabasca Basin. That expansion, referred to as Phase 2 of the mine previously, and now known as the Cigar Lake Extension, comprises of the western portion of the deposit. The expansion is expected to extend mine life through to 2036, provided things go to plan. Surface work is said to have started on the development of this extension last year, while Cameco indicated that in 2025 they intend to continue earthworks as well as construction of surface services to support the expansion of freeze activities. A 2024 technical report outlined that the expansion is expected to cost about $895 million, including $520 million in pre-development work, while the expansion is expected to increase after cash operating costs from $18.75 a pound to $20.58 a pound. So in short, currently Cameco is also facing a supply cliff in 2031, absent the completion of this expansion at Cigar Lake. Should that expansion be completed on time and sufficiently, the cliff gets bumped out a few years to 2036, which at least buys them some time to get other assets up and running. Now, it would be a lopsided argument for us to present the coming supply cliff, without acknowledging that other supply is expected to come online in the next few years, even if the estimates from UXC don't really highlight it. For long-term viewers of our content, this is of course where we bring up both Denison Mines and Next Gen Energy. In the case of Denison, their Phoenix ISR facility, part of Wheeler River, with an average production rate of 8.4 million pounds a year is expected to come online around mid-2028. But production declines will already be starting around 2031, which oddly is a significant year in terms of uranium declines. As for next gen, their Rook 1 project is expected to be a monster with average annual production of up to 30 million pounds annually. A previously published feasibility study suggests that the mine will have an initial mine life of 11 years, with the operation expected to be one of the largest and lowest cost uranium mines globally. While the company has been rather quiet on expected first production timelines as of late, they along with Denison are in the final stages of the CSNC approval process for their project. Analysts have suggested that currently the production start is expected around 2031, which is based on construction getting underway in mid-2026, which given the current supply drop-offs anticipated from global majors is rather convenient for the developer. All right, so let's wrap it up. Are we headed for a supply cliff right now? Yes, inarguably, but we should also dial things back a bit here. First, it's the tail end of 2025. 
That means there's still five or six years for the producers to figure out their path forward. Whether that means aggressive exploration or getting their heads out of the sand and doing some restarts, or even finding some M&A opportunities that will allow more pounds to come online. But then again, NextGen and Denison both started the permitting process all the way back in 2019. So without some major changes to the current permitting process, well, we might be in trouble at least in the West. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. If there's stories you want us to cover, as always, let us know in the comment section. We're always looking for ideas. If you want more mining content, check out our website over at thedeepdive.ca. And if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. All right, everybody, thanks for watching.